starting this is going to be an IC on common neuroophthalmology complaints in children and we are first going to be starting with Dr. Siddharth Kesarwani. Dr. Siddharth is an alumni of LV Prasad Eye Institute and he is a private practitioner now in Bombay at his clinic JNR Eye and Squint Clinic and he's going to be talking to us about how to evaluate a child um, who apparently cannot see. Yeah, good morning everybody. Thanks Varshni uh, for that introduction and inclusion in this IC. And uh, welcome to our uh, instruction course. So I'll be speaking about evaluation of a screaming toddler. Now evaluation of a screaming toddler is itself a difficult task. And to get out clues from the neuro-ophthalmological point of view is even more demanding. But let us just go through the basics of examining a child who is not cooperative. So what is the common presentation? Not, it's not uncommon in a pediatric clinic to have a toddler between two to four years of age who is terrified of the doctor. He may have some behavioral issues also or he may just be a normal kid who has got stranger anxiety. And he may have been sent for a routine examination or he may be suspected of having a problem. So this is the common presentation of a toddler. And on top of that, if he is not cooperative, then that becomes a problem. Let us, this is a small clip of a uncooperative child, a typical uncooperative child. He doesn't have any neurological issues. So he's just shit set, terrified of the uh, doctor. So his examination actually took six minutes, but I have compressed it into one and a half minutes. You can see uh, 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 that the child is extremely uncomfortable when he comes. And then you don't do, you don't jump into the examination right away. You give him some time, you know, and then gradually he tries to relax a little bit when his threat perception is lowered. And then gradually you can do an external examination, you can do a retinoscopy. All the time he's on the verge of breaking down, but still somehow you try to uh, complete the task slowly and steadily, one thing at a time. <coughs> you may not be able to follow the whole sequential thing of, you know, whatever you do in an adult examination where you take vision and then you do external examination, then you do refraction, then you dilate, then you do fundus. Here, whatever is allowing you to do, you do that. So there is no particular sequence of examining a toddler. It's just that keep your eyes open from the moment he comes in and then go about your business of trying to find as much information as possible. Because your first response when you see a child who is crying is, child is uncooperative, schedule for EU. Now, if that kind of a, a thing is there, then it becomes, you are not going to see what, what is there. So some information is always better than no information. And doesn't matter how uncooperative the child is, just by cajoling him, by showing him things which are new. So you should always have a bunch of toys which are, you know, whenever you go abroad or something, buy, pick up some toys which are not easily available in the, our country. So that child doesn't have exposure to them. So whenever they see that is a novelty value. So it grabs their attention for a few seconds. And you know, that is enough for you to pick up the signs. So first is the attitude. The attitude should be, yes, this child is uncooperative, fine. But let me try and see what I can do about it. If you see, okay, this is uncooperative and that's it. Then end of examination, refer to pediatric ophthalmologist or schedule for EUA, you are going to miss a lot of things. It just requires a different approach. The approach is that you cannot put it in the conveyor belt thing, you know, where the whole sheet gets filled up one after the other. There are going to be missing gaps, but we'll come to that later. But whatever you can pick up, you pick up. So you break it down into small components. Let the child calm down. He will be crying. He'll be screaming at the top of the, sometimes they scream so loudly that I put some cotton ball in my ears because it is so shrill. But then that only that, because if you are, if you are, if you are uncomfortable, you will not approach the child. So you first become yourself, you know, you should become comfortable. So I put some cotton balls in my ears. Then I slowly stand there. I show him my hands, see nothing. <laughs> I don't have any syringe or anything. So don't worry about it. And let the mother talk to the child or the father talk to the child. Again, the trick is don't get too many relatives inside the examination hall because if there are grandparents also, then somebody or the other is going to, you know, he's shifting from one lap to another and he's from uh, somebody's arms to other, then it becomes more difficult. So maybe one, one parent or at the max two parents uh, inside. 
don't dim the light immediately darkness you know children are afraid of darkness so don't dim the light switch off the light completely to do retinoscopy you should have some light in the room don't wear a coat that is a given <coughs> don't touch the child for some time don't try to hold his head or something like do stay away you know he doesn't want you anywhere near him so let the child move around so he feels like running sometimes these adhd children are there autistic children are they very very restless so they will want to go around the room and touch things and pick up things and feel things let them do that for some time you know sometimes i mean your when a pediatric clinic is there we kind of keep it child proof so not many things in our clinic can be broken by a child <laughs> so our paint is child proof and our uh, toys are child proof and our uh, show pieces are also child proof so if they drop it and uh, there is no uh, no breakage or anything then pretend that you are examining the chi- uh, pa- child's parent you know you don't even talk to the child for some time when you pretend that you are looking at his eyes and all so he'll start looking at the mother or father or whatever and then slowly approach the child so your approach has to be very slow it's like you know going to close to diffuse a time bomb you know very very slow slowly you go with your <laughs> probe and the moment you feel some problem again take a step back and <coughs> you should show them things they would be attracted in promise them that you will give them that but don't give them immediately so it's like the carrot kind of a thing you should keep dangling one carrot after the other not give all the sweets at a time every time he cooperates give him some more incentive and if a child is sucking thumb or you know he is on a pacifier that is not the time to enforce discipline so let him suck his thumb or let him use the pacifier or his bottle or because parent will immediately keep taking out the thumb you know reflexly so that is not the time to teach him that some sucking is bad <laughs> whatever makes him cooperative that is fine ba- for the older children always they are very much interested in chips so give them a bag of chips the moment they are eating you know they need some distraction so it's like distract them all the time vision testing he is not going to read the chart to forget so you are just depending on whether the vision is equal or not and is there any reason for you to suspect that whether vision is bad or good cardiff acuity sometimes because it is done from a distance uh, then you might be able to do it if a child is home schooled for picture matching sometimes they might match a few pictures again few pictures not don't expect them to go all the way through 69 or 66 what you are interested in is their equality of vision or not and is there any unexplained inequality or not lot of encouragement will be required don't say things like no this is wrong or uh, don't shake your head in disappointment many times one of the parent is sitting and shaking his head in disappointment so you have to keep them and the child looks at him and then he just simply stops saying anything that's it that's the end of the examination because he wouldn't say anything unless he is assured of agreement from the parent and they keep the parent keeps doing this he doesn't want to say anything then you do a casual observation whether there is a squint on on cursory examination what do you see you see a child has got a squint or not whether he has got any abnormal posture of the head or not or whether he is making the you know some kind of chin depression or chin elevation or whether he is squinting his eyes <coughs> then you can shine the faint torch light the problem with torch light these days most of them are leds and they are very bright so if you shine a torch led torch in somebody's li- eyes you know they go blind for few seconds i think i am out of time no i think it's i'll take fine a minute or two extra <coughs> yeah. and so always if you have a led torch cover the torch with two three fingers and just lead, leave a bit very little gap for the light to pass through always remember that because led torches you know it is like hitting the uh, you know car light it's like that it's that bad um, then check the pupil again pupil checking is difficult in children because they'll keep looking at the light so you have to distract them show them some video at a far away you know place and then they can you can do check the pupil pupil will give you a lot of information when it comes to vision retinoscopy i showed you in the video how quickly i let them touch the lens so i give them the lens in their hand then they examine the lens then by the time they are examining the lens i pick up another lens and i do the retinoscopy then i give that lens again so every time it becomes an incentive every lens i pick up goes in the child's hand now the children know they are very bad at multitasking so you give them something in both hands suddenly when you give them the third thing they don't know what to do whether to drop this whether to take it that confusion is the time where you can do so many things so you have to confuse them 
it's like a magician tricking somebody you know you make them look at so many things and then you quickly slip in the trick you can do a quick cover test cover test will quickly tell you whether there is any small squint or whether there is any inequality of inequality of vision and you can do a indirect ophthalmoscopy very well in small children even without dilatation if you are able to sufficiently distract them because if you leave that for post dilatation sometimes child will totally be so panicky after putting drops that that's the end of the examination so maximum amount of examination has to be finished before you put the drops now children are uh, this kind of instruments if you have in our clinic uh, in your clinic it is good because of this is a vision screener it is basically taking infrared photographs of the child's eye <coughs> and then that gives you so much information regarding refraction it will also give you some information regarding squint and pupillary size also so this can be done standing at 1 meter so if you have a pediatric clinic it is worth investing in a photo screener you can also do fields very quickly so if you show him one toy and you bring some another toy from the periphery and looks on that side you know that side field is reasonably good color vision is not possible to test in you know children who are very small maybe 1 or 2 years old but children who recognize shapes can be tested with color vision made easy kind of a chart which is available which has stars and circles and things like that intraocular pressure can be checked with eye care tonometer beautiful tool no need for drops just sufficient amount of distraction and you can quickly get one or two readings and most of the times it rules out any elevated iop and then you comes to the dilatation most of the time you send them home ask them to dilate at home and come and never tell them that the drops will not sting because they will lose trust if you lie to them if you say no this is not going to sting and it stings he will not cooperate you tell them it will feel funny it will feel like sea water or something like that so then when it goes they are prepared for it and then they won't become uncooperative and will not lose faith now at the at the end of it there are still some children who are categorized as untestable so they are sometimes extremely aggressively behaving or things like that in such a thing change the entire thing change the setting so take him in the hall or check or sometimes send your optometrist to their home for checking change the person maybe he doesn't like you that's okay he doesn't like your beard he doesn't like your face he doesn't like your glasses maybe he's more cooperative with a female examiner many times i feel where i fail my optometrist succeeds so change the person and you can involve the caregiver they can do a cover test at home when he is watching tv and give you the information or make a video so many times i delegate that responsibility to the parent they can also come back with some pictures or something like that or you can reschedule the examination for another day the problem with rescheduling for another day is may, many patients are lost to follow up because parents feel this is going to get repeated so we will go when the child grows up and there are several instances where i have told them to come another day and they come after 5 years and they will tell you sir he was not cooperating so we thought we will bring him when he grows up so rescheduling on another day is not a good idea rescheduling on the same day is a better idea so you keep them waiting ask them to take a round and come back and try and do it like that observation sometimes i hide behind the uh, glass and see them in the waiting hall and that gives me lot of information i think i am exceeding time a lot i this is my last slide eua should be avoided if you are smart enough with your examination 99% eua can be avoided don't try to sedate the child in the opd never do that because you don't know his medical history many of them can go into respiratory distraction or apnea always do any kind of sedation thing wherever there is backup okay and many times just making the child hungry and then feeding the child and making him sleep is enough to get you enough information i think i'll leave the electrophysiology and this thing for the next speakers because they are going to cover in their talks thank you very much